Uh, so this is a lecture for my third hour class on the 11th day of uh, April. Anyway, um, his personal habits were disgusting. He was about six foot two. Uh, he had long, matted, greasy hair. His beard, I don't think, you know, they say of, the, of these, so there's an old saying about some of these peasants that they only had two baths in their lifetime, one on the day they were born and one on the day they died. And I mean, on the day he dies, he's going to get a real bath. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, but he, he got real power, you know, and uh, he would sit at the head table with the royal family during these banquets. And on one occasion, um, you know, nobody, there, were, there were all the hundreds of people in this big room in this big palace, and they were, he was right up there at the head table. But, you know, of course, they served the first, first course, which was fish soup. That sounds absolutely horrible, fish soup. But I guess it's a favorite in Russia. And uh, anyway, they... Uh, you know, nobody would eat until the, the, the czar took the first sip, you know, the first sip. Of, and so the czar's down there chatting and Rasputin's late. And he just comes and plops himself down. You know, you can smell him coming around the corner. And, uh, he's just sitting there looking around like, why aren't you all eating? Uh, and all of a sudden he just dips his fingers into the fish soup and starts just <laughs> slurping up this soup. And, you know, that caused these nobles sitting at the table to turn and look down. And of course they could see the side view of him and his beard is actually in the soup that he's eating. And they could see, they could see lice falling out of his beard into the soup that he was eating. So that he never washed his hands, that never washed his hands, never, ever, ever washed his hands. And people, once he gets power so they can get in with the Royal family, they would kneel and kiss, you know, that, that filthy hand. Uh, people paid him a lot of money to give them a little strip of paper, you know, something something like, uh, this is something I can waste here, something like this, uh, you know, and if he would just write on there, do this for me, Gregory, uh, and you could hand that to the Tsarina, whatever you ask, almost anything you ask would be granted. And when he got tired of taking their gold, someone would come up and say, oh, you know, Gregory, I'd like a favor from the Tsarina. And he would say, fine, you know, what's it going to cost me? Well, you know, it's not going to cost you any money. I've got all the money I need. But, you know, the other night at that banquet, I noticed you've got a beautiful teenage daughter. And I would like her. And people literally surrendered up their daughters to this guy to, to get uh, favors from, um, from the Tsarina. And, again, anybody that criticized him, anybody that criticized him, uh, they, were, they were banished. So, you know, he's got, by World War I, get this down, from 1912 to 1914, he's he, he living in the royal palace, and he, gets, and he gets a lot of power. And by the way, of all the nations, get the, all this down, of all the nations that, you know, should have not have entered in the war, and by the way, none of these nations should have fought this war. We've talked about that. But Russia really had the most to lose. Uh, but it didn't appear that way. Listen, it didn't appear that way when the war started. In fact, Russia had a, uh, uh, you know, when the war started, it, it appeared that Russia was very, very powerful. I mean, you know, in this current war that Russia's in, I was just listening to the news. They said the Russians figured they would take the capital of Ukraine in three days, 72 hours. And uh, they've not taken it yet. And they've been driven out of that part of the country. So they appeared to be very strong, but they may not be as strong uh, as people suspected. Well, uh, when the war broke out, get this down, the, Russian, uh, the Russians had a 15 million man army. I mean, so powerful. It was called the Russian steamroller. That's what people called it. Of course, it had never fought. Well, it actually fought against Japan in 1905 and got beaten, but that was mainly a naval war. The Russian steamroller. And here was the Allied plan once the war starts. The British and the French simply said, we'll hold the Germans here on the Western Front. But the Russian army, the Russian steamroller, will come 15 million men. They'll fall in on the rear of Germany and crush it, and the war will be over. And that's what they planned to do. However, get this down. This Russian steamroller was not what it appeared to be. It was a peasant army. Listen, I'll just cut to the chase here. They had 15 million men, and they had 4 million rifles. Okay, 15 million men, 4 million rifles. Here's the way they're going to fight the war. They're going to line everybody up. They're going to put all the guys in the front row with a rifle, okay? And there might be, you might be the guy on the front row with the rifle about to go over the hill and attack the Germans, and there were 15 guys behind you. And the theory was, when the guy with the rifle gets killed, you take his rifle and keep going, or when he's killed, you. they don't have gas masks, they don't have tanks, very few machine guns, they don't even have helmets, they've got little skull caps. Uh, a lot of times they're just given sticks, 
You know, don't ever take a stick to a gunfight. A lot of these uh, Russians are going to find that out. <coughs> In fact, on the Eastern Front, get this down. We've talked a lot about the Western Front. I'm just going to say one thing about the Eastern Front. But get this down. Uh, in the opening days of the war, <coughs> so the Russians send the steamroller forward. By the way, <clears throat> a lot of times they would line them up in ranks, okay? We're going to go over this hill and attack the Germans. And these guys don't have guns. They don't have helmets. They don't have gas masks. Here they are going into the first real modern war in history with sticks, okay, <laughs> essentially. Uh, and they would line them up in ranks, and they would put a Russian Orthodox priest in a cart with a donkey pulling it several Russian Orthodox priests, because there would be tens of thousands of men out there. And about the only protection you had is that they would have an altar boy standing there with a little vial of holy water, and they would stand there, and they would dip this thing in there, and they would ride between the ranks, and they would sprinkle you with holy water, and then you went over the hill and got your head shot off, okay? The, that's the way it's going to go for the Russians. But there's only one battle, only one battle on the Eastern Front. I'll ask you this on your quiz tomorrow, and some of you will put the battle of the Marne, but I can't help that. All I can do is teach. Uh, the Battle of Tannenberg, okay? The Battle of Tannenberg, and that took place right up here. And the Russians sent tens of thousands of men forward attacking the Germans, and the Germans had machine guns, and the Germans started killing them at 3,000 yards. And in that one battle, the Russians lost one million men killed and wounded. One million men killed and wounded. In one day? In one day. Now, hey, that's like everybody in Tulsa and Oklahoma City and Little Rock being killed, dying in one day. Now, that, now, I must say this. They're not all killed. They're killed and wounded, but it was a million. Listen, they killed so no, listen, Those Germans killed so many Russians that they had to stop firing in the middle of the battle because the bodies had piled up too high, and they had to send soldiers out to kick down the piles of bodies so they would have a clear line of fire to kill more Russians, okay? And they did. They killed Russians all day long, and the generals just kept feeding them in and feeding them in and feeding them in, okay? And it was just an absolute, it was an absolute a disaster. I see here that 260,000 were killed at that battle in one day and 800,000 were, were wounded, okay? Well, it was a disaster. Get this down, write this down. World War I caused the Russian Revolution. It took the life of the czar and the royal family. Well, as soon as the war started, the czar said, come here, you little czar bitch. And they he didn't say that. He, there's the czar and the czar bitch. What are y'all thinking? Come here, you little czar bitch. Get over here. Get over here. Get out here. Stand right there, you little czar bitch. Anyway, there's the little czar bitch dressed just like daddy. And they get on a train, get this down, and they go up to the front. They, they leave St. Petersburg. The capital is St. Right? The cap, you with me? The capital of St. Petersburg? Yes. Let me go back to this map. St. Petersburg is right up here. The Tsar and the little Tsarevich leave, and they go down here to the front where all this fighting and dying is taking place. Now, that was a huge mistake. Get this down. Here's why. It's a huge mistake. See, he's dressed. Dad's in his military uniform. He's the commander of the army. There's all of his generals. Uh, there's the little Tsarevich in his uniform. Uh, anyway, that was a huge mistake. If the czar would have stayed in St. Petersburg when this massacre of the Russian army happened, he would have been far away and he could have blamed it on the generals. But when he goes up there, get this down, and he takes personal command, if he goes down there and takes personal command, now the blame for the war is going to fall on him. And that's what's going to destroy him. So that was a huge, he, stood, he should have stayed in the palace. By the way, when he leaves the palace, who does that leave in charge of the government in Russia? His wife. His wife and, and who is her chief advisor? Rasputin. Rasputin. See things starting to go south here a little bit? Okay. So, you know, listen, up until the czar goes to the front, the Russian people, despite all these horrible deaths, the Russian people had supported the czar. They believed that God, to, listen, to go against the czar was to go against God. But 
uh, that spell, that mythical, mystical, not mythical, that mystical spell is going to be broken. It's going to be broken by World War I. Well, so the war was going badly. Get this down. And with the war going badly, listen to what I'm going to say to you. Several groups in Russia, several groups in Russia who had long been working for years, they had been working to get rid of the czar, the socialists, the communists, and write this group down, the Bolsheviks, and just uh, the Bolsheviks, as it turned, same thing. If I say, you know, as it turns out, there's a long, complicated explanation that I will not go into here, but um, the Bolsheviks and the communists are essentially the same. Now listen to what I'm saying. Those groups had long been fighting to overthrow the czar. And by the way, the czar had a secret police and he was waging war against them. He was trying, everyone he could hunt down and hang, he hunted down and he hunted, okay? Uh, so they were trying to overthrow the Russian government. But when the war starts and the czar goes down to the front, get this down, and the war starts going wrong, these groups, get this down, see an opportunity. They, they see the war not as a disaster. In fact, they're praying it'll get more disastrous. They see this war as an opportunity to finally overthrow. Are you with me? Finally to overthrow the czar. Okay? And that's what they start working to do. Meanwhile, the winter, let's go to the winter of 1916-1917. The winter of 1916-1917. It's one of the worst in Russian history. And by the way, when I talk about a bad Russian winter, we had a little snowfall here a couple of weeks ago and got out of school for a week or something. And when I say a, a severe Russian winter, uh, I'll just put it to you this way. In 1941, in World War II, Hitler will invade the Soviet Union, and that destroyed Hitler. That's where the war was lost in Russia. World War II, the European war was lost. In that invasion... The weather dipped to 70 degrees below zero. Uh, it's not at all. Uh, it's not at all uh, unusual in a Russian winter for it to get 40 degrees below zero or 30 degrees below zero. Well, this 1916-17 winter was a particularly particularly I can't say that word bad winter. It got 50 degrees below zero, and get this down. Communications broke down. Write this down. Communications broke down. Transportation broke down. They couldn't get food from the countryside. They didn't have that much food anyway, but the, they, they couldn't get food from the countryside to the big cities. And people in the cities, get this down, started to starve. I want you to write this down. The great catalyst of the Russian Revolution is World War I and hunger. World War I and hunger. That's the great catalyst of the Russian Revolution. By the way, think about this. Most revolutions that were ever fought were fought because the people got hungry. The French Revolution was fought because the people of France were starving. And they overthrew the King Louis XVI and chopped his head off and his Queen Marie Antoinette cut their heads off. The Russian Revolution, people are starving and they're going to rise up and destroy the Tsar and institute a new form of government called communism, in which, by the way, they will find themselves worse off. Most revolutions, you end up worse off than when you started. There is, by the way, a revolution that is an exception to that. Can you name me a revolution that was not fought? The American, the American Revolution. You're absolutely right. Yeah, you're absolutely right. By the way, the guys who fought America, they're fat, sassy, and happy. They're pretty well-to-do. Yeah, this country's doing just fine. So what was our revolution fought for? Well, two generals. What? Well, uh, two generals. What's what's the what's the founding idea of the American Revolution? What what did those sixteen year old boys stand barefooted in the snow, clinging to a musket that probably didn't have any gunpowder in it? They just needed to be out there looking like they were soldiers. What did they do year after year and a lot of them died? What what idea? You know, ideas are powerful things. I keep telling you that. This was once just an idea in somebody's head. The Christian religion was just once an idea bouncing around in somebody's head. Nazism was just once an idea bouncing around in somebody's head. Communism was once just an idea bouncing around in somebody's head. Ideas are powerful things. What idea was the American Revolution based on? Excellent. 
All men are created equal. I've tried to teach you that since August. Why have you learned it? That's some progress. All men are created equal. That's what our revolution was based on. And by the way, after the French Revolution, you know, they said the king was a dictator. Louis was a, Fat Louis was a dictator, so they killed him. And who did they end up with after the revolution? A greater dictator named Napoleon. After the Russian Revolution, they said the Tsar was a dictator, so they killed him. And who did they end up with after the Russian Revolution? A guy named Lenin and a guy named Stalin that you'll meet in a couple of minutes, and they killed 50 million Russians. After the Russian Revolution, they had less freedom. After the French Revolution, they had less freedom. But after our revolution, we had more. Do we have more... Do we have more liberty in this country than we had in 1789? We sure do. And we sure do. We absolutely do. I can prove that right now. When you're 18, you can vote. When that, in that room at the Constitute, when they were writing this, if somebody, that would have been unheard of. That would have shot them to the soles of their feet. Women vote? Good God. But they can today. We've got a woman vice president. We just had another woman, first African-American woman put on the Supreme Court. You live in an exceptional country. You know what exceptional means? You live, you live in a country that's done something. An exceptional, exceptionalism is doing something that no one else has ever done. We're the first country in history based on the idea that all men are created equal. And that equality, and at the time this country was created, all people weren't equal. I got a newsflash for you. All people aren't equal today. But that's a goal we're going to. More and more and more and more and more and more and more equality in this country. And that's the way this thing works. And you live in a country that's a product of a revolution, but after our revolution, liberty expanded. After most revolutions, including the one I'm talking about, it constricts. You've got less than you had when you started, and that makes this an exceptional country. So why does that happen? I'm going to tell you. That's a good question. I'm going to tell you. <clears throat> Absolutely. All right, so by the winter of 1916, 1917, there were food shortages. There were millions of people dead in the war. And get this down, protesters start marching through the streets of St. Petersburg. And who's in St. Petersburg running the government? Well, the Tsarina and Rasputin, yeah. And people are marching through the streets. And there's a fear that those people might rise up in revolution. And so the Tsarina needs advice. How do I handle this? And by the way, they had warehouses of food for the army. So should I open up and feed these people and avoid a revolution, keep my throne, keep my head? She goes to Rasputin. And what did Rasputin tell her? Yeah. No, don't do it. He said, if you cave into their demands this time, tomorrow they'll be back with 10 demands. Don't do it. He told her, she, he says, she, he said, send out the army. Shoot them. This is what he said. He said, he said, the, this is exactly what he said. He said, the Russian people love the feel of the whip. That's what he said. He said that's how you handle it. Whip them. And you know, they actually had a cavalry unit. They wore fur caps. They were called the Cossacks. You've heard of them maybe. And they had knotted ropes hanging over the saddle of their horses. And in the rope, they had embedded pieces of metal and glass and shark, and they would ride among the people and just lash them. And that's what Rasputin did. Said, send them out. So she did. And they said, and they killed somebody. Let me tell you something. If your aspiration, if I'm reading an old yearbook someday and see your picture in it and said future plans and your future plans say to be the dictator of a small country. Well, if you ever become a dictator of a small country or a large one, let me tell you, if you ever have a protest on your hands, you ever have a protest on your hands, uh, and you shoot people, and there's a thousand people out front of the palace, and you send the army out and shoot them, how many will there be the next day? 10,000. And you send them out there and shoot them, uh, the next day there will be 20,000. That's a good, quick way to start a revolution. And that's what Rasputin tells her to do. And by the way, there were people in Russia, get this down, there were people, but there were, listen, listen, there were members of the royal family, get this down, the royals, remember, 90% of the Russian people are poor, uh, semi-literate peasants, about 10% of royalty, and there were people in the royal family, and they knew that this policy would lead to disaster, including this young man right here. There he is, 
Felix Usopov. You don't have to write him down. Uh, he married the Tsar's niece. There's the Tsar's niece, Princess Irina. She was considered to be the most beautiful woman in all of Russia, and he married her. Uh, he also was a homosexual. He had several male lovers, but he wanted power, and so he married into the royal family, okay? Uh, and he was an aristocrat. He was living good. They were living in a great palace, and he knew that if, if a revolution started, that the first people that were going to be stood up against the wall shot would be them. So he went to the Tsarina, and he said to her, feed the people, feed them, or we're going to have a revolution. And of course, who does she go to for advice? Rasputin, don't listen to that guy. You're doing exactly what you need to do. Shoot him. Send out the Cossacks. Show strength. There's nothing that people admire more than a strong leader. Go out there and flog him, whip him, and shoot him. Uh, and she continued to do that. And get this down. More and more people are joining this movement out in the streets. It looks like a revolution is going to happen. So get this down. Yusupov and a group of his friends. Get this down. I wouldn't write down Yusupov, but a group of Russian nobles. A group of Russian nobles, but there Yusupov and his friends, mainly Yusupov. He persuades them, we're never going to get, be able to get to the Tsarina and talk sense to her as long as Sue is around. So what's his solution? Let's go, no, let's go, let's go have a talk with Rasputin. Let's just sit down and talk and exchange ideas. He said, we're going to kill him. No, he didn't say that. We're going to sit down and talk with him. That would be the day. Yeah. He said, we're going to kill him. They said, well, how are you going to do that? So here's what he did. Yusupov invited Rasputin to a party at his house. There's his house. It's still there. That's the house Rasputin was killed in. That's got 1,500 rooms. Hmm? His, house. his house. That's just one of his houses. <laughs> By the way, when you walk in the front door there, there's the entryway. You want to take your phones out and take a picture of that and tell your parents you'd like your bedroom decorated like that? My next. You couldn't fit the staircase in there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so they invite him. They invite him to uh, a party. But oddly enough, Rasputin wasn't a big partier. You know, he, uh, you know, you might think, you know, with all that power he had, he was pretty. But he wasn't. He didn't like going to those social functions. And he said, "No." He said, "I'm not coming." And he said, "Well, and here's the way that Usopov got him there. You know, Usopov said, "Well, I'll tell you what. If you can." Uh, if you'll come, he said, I understand. You don't like crowds. You don't like people that well. Uh, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll let you uh, just come down to, you know, here's the here's the main house. You know, he said, I've got a basement down there. You know? and, and by the way, it's not the kind of basement you and I are used to, or at least I'm used to. You can go down. There's a kerosene lamp for the tornado, and there are, you know, cans, jelly, and green beans, and spider webs, you know, you know. Uh, this was a beautiful, beautiful place. That hand car fireplace, it was a great big chandelier. It had over stuffed furniture that was a white bearskin rug. It was kind of, I guess, what they would call today. Uh, somebody said at first hour, his man cave. That's where he went to get away from everybody. He said to Rasputin, just come in. Come in the back entrance. You can go down there. And Rasputin said, no, I don't want to do that. He said, well, he said, I'll tell you why. Uh, after my wife and I greet all the guests, he said, I'll make sure that you have some private time with my wife. And what did Rasputin say? Oh, yes. I'll be there. What time? <laughs> Seven o'clock. So, so I think it was December 17th, 1916. I know it was 19, December of 1916. So Rasputin, you know, is coming. Well, you slop off that night <laughs> or that day, made sure that all this, everybody was gone from that big house. Everybody was gone except him and one of his friends and a doctor. And, um, the doctor, you know, they took this, this decanter of wine and the doctor put cyanide in it, okay? And then he took these little cakes they were going to feed Rasputin and they injected it with cyanide. Now, cyanide's so strong, you know, it comes in liquid and gas form, but if this were a little vial of cyanide, I could just do that and kill all of us. That's how, how strong it is. So they were going to poison him. <coughs> so Rasputin shows up and he's down here in the basement and Yusupov goes down there to greet him, and he sits down, and there's a roaring fire in the fire. It's December in Russia. It's cold. There's a roaring fire in the fireplace, and the white bearskin rug, and you know, Rasputin settles back into that comfortable couch, and there's a table in front of him. It's got cakes and wine. And by the way, I'm telling you the version that Yusupov gave. Um, there are disputed versions as to what happened, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you the story that Yusupov later gave. But anyway, he's sitting there, and Yusupov says, have some wine, and Rasputin pours him some wine, you know. 
takes a drink and Usopov is just sitting there waiting for him to drop and nothing happens. And he has another drink of wine. Well, have some cakes. And he eats that and nothing happens. And so Usopov says, uh, excuse me just a moment. And he uh, runs upstairs and he grabs that doctor by the lapels and he said, I thought you said you put enough cyanide in there to kill a bull elephant. You know, that guy's down there eating cakes, drinking wine, and nothing. The doctor said, I don't know what went wrong. Usopov said, okay, we'll go to plan B. And he pulls out his pistol. Okay. <laughs> and he goes walking down the stairs, you know. But by the time he gets back down there, Rasputin was standing up in front of the fire, warming his hands. And uh, Usopov shouts across the room, Grigory Rasputin, say your prayers. And Rasputin, there you go. Bam, bam, shot him. And he fell out on this white bearskin rug. Usopov goes back upstairs, tells those guys, this guy's a long, lean character. I'm going to need some help getting him out of here. And those three head down. I remember Rasputin's been poisoned and shot twice. And they're coming downstairs. And when, and when they come down the stairs, Rasputin's up on his all fours, just breathing like a... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and he gets... You know, he doesn't get up. He just scrambles across the room <coughs> toward them. And they all scream and run back up the stairs. And there's three of them. And he's been... Shot twice and poisoned. <laughs> and by and finally he gets to his feet, he's staggering down the hall, and, and these guys are running for dear life. <coughs> and Rasputin goes out the door, <clears throat> or about to go out the door, you know, this Russian winter, and he yells it back at them. They're running, and he says, I'm gonna tell the Tsarina everything. And boy, as scared as they were, that stopped them in their tracks. And so, uh, you know, they thought if he tells the if, if the guy lives, you know, we're we're done. And so they go back out and he's staggering across the courtyard. Bam, bam, shoot him two more times, drag him in, wrap him up in a curtain, tie his hands and feet, wrap him up in a curtain. And then for good measure, there was a brass lamp in the corner. They bashed his uh, front of his skull in and then they take him out and, and they chop a hole in the Neva River and stuff him in there and go home. About three days later, a guy's ice fishing. <laughs> what is it? The car? Ah, it's Rasputin. Uh, and they bring him out. And of course, there was one story that when they did the autopsy, his lungs had water in it. Uh oh. That meant that after all that, he was still alive when they shoved him in the river. Oh, Lord. But uh, they did say that his hands were untied. They had tied his hands, and his hands were untied. Okay. So he may have been alive after all that when they stepped him in the river. But he wasn't. He finally got that bath. Uh, but he wasn't alive anymore, okay? Where did he go, little rascal? There, whoops. Oh, crap. <laughs> Always something. Where's that? Uh, uh, whoops, where did he go? There. Uh... You know, uh, they wrote a rap song about him in the 19... In, in, I mean, a, a, a uh, disco song, not a rap song. They wrote a disco song about him in the 70s. And one of the lines said, he drank some poison and took a shot to the head. and He really wasn't dead. People were dancing that to the, in the 70s. That shows how awful that decade is. But you have to think, you know, 60 years after you're dead, will people be writing songs about you? So there he is. He was dead. He had written this to the Tsarina about uh, a month before this happened. He said, I feel like my life is going to end very soon. He said, if I'm killed by the Russian people, you and your family have nothing to worry about. But if a member of your family kills me, you'll all be dead within two years. Well, a member of the royal family killed him. Uh, and uh, the royal family, was they were all dead within two years. So what does that tell you? Ooh, nothing. Okay, just nothing, got nothing, to, uh, sorry, sorry, <laughs> anyway. Well, so, <clears throat> with Rasputin dead, get this down, with Rasputin dead, all right, let's see, here's this, this disco song. They put some, this disco in the 70s, you know, the worst decade in history. I lived every rotten year of that decade. I was never so happy to see a decade go away. And if you don't believe that was a rotten decade, just go play some disco song. Just play that. You know, that'll make you want to go to war. But <laughs> this was 1974. Uh, they put some poison in his wine. He drank it all and said, I feel just fine. <laughs> People were dancing that. Anyway, so what does all this mean for the war? You know, interesting story. And again, that's just Usopov's version. What does this mean for the war? Get this down. Well, the Germans were watching that. 
Get this down. The Germans were watching the conditions. Write this down. The Germans were watching the conditions deteriorate in Russia. In other words, after the death of Rasputin, Russia was on the brink of a, of a revolution. And look at this map real quick. Here's what the Germans want to do. The Germans want a revolution to start in Russia that will take Russia out of the war. Got that? Yeah, got that? Take Russia out. On the Eastern Front, the Germans had two million men fighting the Russians. Now remember, this is, the you know, Rasputin is killed in December of 1916. So now we're in 1917. In 1917, the United States declares war declares war. So Germany, just a second, Germany wants a revolution to take Russia out of the war. Now listen to what I'm saying. So they can take those two million men they've got on the eastern front, you with me, and rush them where? Back in Russia. No, no, not in the, 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 the Germans have two. They want to rush them since they will not, if, if Russia is taken out of the war by a revolution, since they will no longer need those two million men on the Eastern Front, rush them quickly to the Western Front and defeat the British and the French before the Americans can arrive. That's the great plan. But they need a man to start the revolution. And write this down. So when I ask you tomorrow after your quiz, where did we stop? There was a man in Switzerland. Switzerland's a neutral country. Yeah, there's a guy in Switzerland. So we'll take up that and finish the Russian Revolution tomorrow and go on. Oh, I gotta record grades. Okay. I didn't do it last week. Stalin and Hitler together? No. Were they together? Yeah. No, they. They were deeply in love. First, they were. Oh. At first, yeah. they were allies in World War II, and then Hitler invaded what? Germany. Uh, Hitler invaded you, Russia. You want some ducks? Oh. And they became deadly enemies. Okay. Yeah.
Thank you. Color guard practice and trials will start Monday, April 25th. Please email Mr. Helms or Ms. Barnes and Aristotle. Juniors are taking the science and history day testing tomorrow, April 12th. You will all need to be in your designated classroom at 8 a.m. For officer on Google Classroom. You must have your school issue Chromebook fully charged. Bring your own approved method if you do so. Phones, smartwatches, etc. will not be allowed. Students elect me with a representative from Connor State College for concurrent enrollment for the 2020-2021 school year. 